Hello, everybody that's uh, just in the process of being dialed into our Zoom session here. I can see many people just starting to come in and it's fantastic to have you uh, with us, uh, the, whatever time zone you're in around the world. We've got people joining us from all parts of the world for this uh, webinar today that I'm sure is going to be near and dear to most of our hearts in terms of the content that we'll be discussing. I'll just keep seeing people as they, they come in. For those of you that don't know me, uh, my name is Martin Bean and I'm going to be your moderator here today, or should I say co-moderator with Dr. Cheryl Grant and I'll introduce her to you in just a moment. Uh, but it looks like we've got people, people coming in nicely now. So welcome everybody. It's terrific to have you all with us today for this conversation uh, on increasing and diversifying enrollment and micro-credentials. And it's just my pleasure to be uh, the host and moderator for this being our, our second of our luminary webinars that we're running to try to really showcase and share best practices in the adoption and usage of digital badging technologies and all of the related topics that swirl uh, around that. Today's theme, learn how leaders in higher ed are leveraging micro-credentials and digital badges to increase and diversify student enrollment. And we've got three terrific panelists with us today, and it's great to have you with us. First is Dr. Michael Trest, who's the director of the Online Workforce College at Jones College in Mississippi. Welcome, Michael. Uh, and I know that you're also the developer of a unique delivery method to bring virtual workforce training to new and existing learners across the state. And my goodness, as I've come to know more about your work, Michael, I've, I've just as a as an educational disruptor, I'm just delighted with some of the work that you're doing. And I hope you can bring as much of that to life for our participants as we can. We also are joined today by Dr. Bill Mosley. Uh, G'day Bill, it's fantastic to have you with us here. Uh, and Bill is the Interim Vice President of Innovation and Development at Bakersfield College in California, having served as Dean of Academic Technology for five years prior. And I know he'll be very well known to many of you that are on the, the webinar today. And, and Bill, congratulations to you for some of the pioneering work that you've been um, developing and, and really bringing to life uh, for the communities that you serve. Again, I know people are going to enjoy hearing more about it. And then my, my partner for today, Dr. Cheryl Grant, who is Badger's Director of Digital Credentialing Strategies and is among the change agents who helped build the field of micro-credentials right from the beginning spearheading the Open Badges movement 12 years ago now, Cheryl, with Mozilla and MacArthur Foundation and Hashtag. So Cheryl, it's fantastic to have you with us as, as well. And welcome everybody. We've still got quite a few people uh, joining us and it's terrific for you to have you with us live for this session. Let me tell you a little bit about the format and then we're going to dive right in. So Cheryl's um, going to be leaving us in just a few moments to go off camera and she uh, and colleagues will be monitoring uh, the chat and Cheryl will be back later to pose some of your questions to the panel and also tease out some of the themes. And, and it, so if I can ask you, uh, last time we ran the webinar, people sort of waited to put their questions into the chat box right at the very end. As they occur to you, as I'm going through my upfront questions, just type them in right away. That'll give Cheryl a chance to look at them and spot themes and think about what we wanna bring back to the panel. So if you can do that for me, that would be uh, very much appreciated. I'm gonna have a conversation with Bill and Michael for about 30 minutes, and then really it's going to be yours. We're going to be via Cheryl having your questions teed up uh, to Bill and Michael. I'll jump in as I've got something to say along the way as I'm sure Cheryl will. But one of the things that we really took away as a, as a fantastic rich artifact from the last webinar was the conversation that was also going on uh, in, in the chat as we were going through the discussion. So feel free to contribute your thoughts and ideas as well, because all of that is being taken on board by Cheryl and the team at Concentric Sky as they continue to lead and pioneer in the evolution of digital badging, micro and alternative credentials. So that's the, the plan. So I hope you're, you're all set uh, and ready to go because I'm about to dive in on the first of my questions here. And the way that's gonna work is I'm gonna pose the questions to both Bill and Michael. Bye for now, Cheryl, we'll see you back in a, in a little while. Um, so Bill, I'm gonna to come to you first. 
Can you tell me a little bit about your institution and the challenges that you are particularly focused on right now? Sure. So uh, Bakersfield College is a community college in California. It's in the central San Joaquin Valley or the south San Joaquin Valley. And uh, we are largely an ag and oil community. And we have uh, right around 35,000 students. Uh, so we're a relatively large college. Uh, and we are, like many of our California community colleges, are uh, very focused on uh, workforce and economic development. So for us, that means that, uh, that we have a very high awareness of some of the changing landscape around the very fields that have uh, kept Kern County alive for so long. Oil and ag are, are both changing very rapidly because of technology, because of climate change, because of shifting energy priorities. So <clears throat> we have a very uh, keen interest in uh, keeping up with the migration of, of skills and, and needs in our area related to skills. So <clears throat> we our student body is very um, <clears throat> diverse and um, I would say non-traditional. Uh, we have a very large focus in terms of moving toward a, an increased adult education uh, presence. And uh, for us, that means a whole lot of non-credit courses and skills-based courses. But we have also, I think, a very strong interest uh, for the sake of our students in putting our non-credit and our, our four credit courses on what, what I would call an even playing field when it comes to uh, providing uh, a, the greatest value to our students. So we have really tried to think through how we roll out our non-credit, our adult education and workforce training programs because uh, we want them to have value and, and we want them to have the same sort of value that, that you would expect from a four credit traditional college program. Um, and and there's, there are a lot of reasons for that, but I'll just sort of park that for now. And, uh, you know, we're, we really, I uh, think badges are, are one of the means that by which we can uh, leverage that value and, and represent our credit and our, and our non-credit uh, curriculum on, on sort of an even, even playing field that allows students to really focus on uh, what's important in today's economy, which is, which is skills. Thank you, Bill. And Bill, one of the things that I've really been impressed by um, in putting them on the level playing field is the way that you've sort of thought about the visual representation of pathways and just pathways more, more generally. Can you just tell me a little bit about why that that was so important to the, your thinking was the was was pathways and the way pathways can be used to help people. Yeah, so um, you know, education is is really uh, it's a journey, and in any journey, it, it helps us to know not only where we're going but also where we're, where we're at. Right. So the two parts to a GPS system are are the map but also also your geolocation within that map. So we've developed a number of tools, uh, most notably the Pathways Program Mapper, uh, which was building in, in conjunction with Concentric Sky. And uh, we actually have embedded badges into that so that students can not only see their, their position within a program or where they're at in, in that program map of where they need to go to complete a program, but they can also drill down and, and, and actually see the skills and badges that they'll earn along the way. So uh, using those two together is a natural fit for us. And uh, we think that that's important, uh, again, because it, it's really about understanding that journey and uh, seeing where you're at and, and seeing how far you have to go and how to get there. Uh, those are seen as, a, as a critical components of, of making that journey successful. I mean, if you think about it, you know, if you're loading a piece of software, you're updating your computer, it shows a progress bar, right? That's the most simple form of a GPS. It shows how far you have to go and, and how far you've come. Uh, but education is, is exponentially more complex than that. So we want to reduce that complexity for students and, and make it simple for them to see uh, how, how they need to, to uh, complete their education. Yeah, and I really love the way you've, you've sort of linked the program and what's going on in the in the economy and what's going on with jobs and 
salary. I mean, you've done a, just a really lovely job of taking the complexity out of that that bill, which I know is driving some wonderful outcomes for you. So, so thank yeah. you. And and Bill, as I've shown that um, methodology and technology to policymakers in Australia, some of them have let out audible gasps of delight as they've seen what you've what you've done. So I encourage others to take a look at it as well. All right, Michael, your turn. Uh, challenges for you. Tell us about your institution and what are the challenges that you're focused on? Absolutely. Yeah. So uh, I'm from Jones College in Ellisville, Mississippi. If any of you have seen the show Hometown um, on HGTV, we are about seven miles north of that town. Um, and so that gives you a little bit of where we are, but we're at kind of a traditional community college. There are 15 different community colleges in the state of Mississippi. And all kind of focused on uh, three things, you know, the academics, uh, career technical education, and workforce. Um, and so kind of the challenge that we were addressing to face was the changing landscape of higher education, right? I mean, we all know that there's kind of this uh, less reliance on the myth that if you go to college, you get a good job. You know, that that's kind of going the way of the buffalo. And so... Um, our leadership started looking for um, untapped student populations. And what they found doing some research was not just an untapped, but a marginalized community that was not being reached by anybody. Um, this, this whole idea of a community that doesn't have, and here's the Sesame Street word of the day, opportunities, right? They don't have opportunities to progress. They are stuck looking at a brick wall and nobody's helping them, right? So uh, we were talking about equity earlier. The idea that um, kind of higher ed has been focused on this single group while the exclusion of others. Um, and so we wanted to try to figure out a way to help this group to open opportunities and open doors for people who didn't have the skills they need to be able to get jobs, to be able to go uh, attend training programs, or attend higher education, right? So that's when we developed my program. And uh, I was brought on board to develop this program called that we call the Online Workforce College. Um, that just kind of something I was looking at the other day, the Mississippi Economic Council released a report last month that reiterated what we were talking about. Um, their study showed that 85, nearly 85% 85 of respondents cited a concern uh, talking about employers. Uh, of people not having soft skills, employability skills, or digital skills. And then they did focus groups across the state and said that people didn't know where to find training for these skills. Um, and I, I would say that not only could they not find the places to get them, they couldn't get there. So what we did, we made this online platform for it's self-paced um, with very small bite-sized chunks of training. Um, so, and this is everything from employability, so communication, teamwork, uh, team building, diverse, diversity training, how to write a resume, what to, how to do, how to present yourself on the first day, all the way to technical skills, um, automation, robotics, welding, you know, all these things. But like welding, for instance, I can't teach you with a self-paced, competency-based micro-credential how to be a welder, but I can give you the foundational knowledge that you'd need to be able to step into a training program or step into um, a career technical program at a community college to take that next step. Whereas before you may have been stuck in a minimum wage job, which we all know how far that gets you these days. Um, and with these little bit of skills training resulting in digital badges, takes you to hopefully opportunities that you weren't presented before. Um, and so that's the goal is trying to help people either have on ramps into better jobs, better paying jobs or training programs or, or community colleges in, in, our, in our case. That's what we would like to see there. Thank you, Michael. And Michael, what are you most proud of with the results? So if you look at the results that are coming through, what, what are the things that you're most proud of? out of gear now. Um, we went through some changes early on trying to look at different ways to organize our, our platform. And we started, um, we started really 
focusing a lot on our local area with some other community colleges. And as we got students to come in, and students, loosely term, learners, um, there's a lot of people that are finding a lot of success. We've had, um, I think it was 24, oh, hang on, I've got the numbers pulled up right here. Um, we've had in, since April of 21, we've had 2,554 users enrolled, 25,000 modules um, started, 22,000 modules completed, so we have an 88% completion rate. And mm. uh, that includes our learners from, that are need to take the procrastination um, module because they haven't finished yet. And so we think the number is going to go up. So we've had an 88% completion rate. That means mm. that um, our is the badges that people earn, the number of badges that people have in their position to share with employers or trainers, 88% who started completed and I'm, I'm really proud of that I think and you should be by any measure with those types of programs Michael you should be really proud of it because what that says is that the, the the learner is not only enjoying the experience they see the value in uh in going through it so so well done it really is a remarkable initiative that that you spearheaded um Bill coming back to you um tell us a bit more about how you've used digital badges specifically to increase and diversify enrollment. You know, how, how, what role have they played and how's it been working for you? Sure. Well, sort of, if, if I can widen the scope a little bit, um, we're, we're taking a real critical look at the Carnegie unit as a measure of learning. And I know that that's a, that's a big fight. And every time I talk about this, I describe it as an evolution, not a revolution. I mean, we're not going to do away with the Carnegie unit that's been an essential part of American education and a global education really for, uh, you know, 115 years, 120 years, whatever. But, but the reality is in the real world out there where we're getting jobs and, and trying to, uh, you know, place people in jobs, it doesn't really matter how long you've sat in a seat. What matters is what you can do. And um, we're searching for an, an accurate reflection of, of what, what people can do and a way to reflect that through our educational process. And so, uh, you know, badges and skills are, are, are a natural fit there, but the way that ties in from, from an equity and enrollment perspective of a diversification of enrollment is really about providing opportunities to folks. So if we can, put a non-credit course, which is tuition free on the same playing field as a, as a four credit course using badges. And we have several non-credit courses that are the exact equivalent of a four credit course. They're, they share a common badge, a common set of skills, uh, even a common curriculum. Then what we've done is we've enabled people to get skills and have access to skills with a, a, a lower barrier to enrollment. And that by, by very virtue of the fact that we're opening up that window for folks uh, allows us to, to reach out to diverse populations. I mean, we, we are, and we're, what we're doing is taking those non-credit skills-based courses and we're, we're taking them to the community. We, we have a, a, a program called Project Higher Up, which actually uh, we bus uh, homeless folks from the local homeless shelter to an educational center where they're provided not only an education, a non-credit tuition-free education, but at the end of the program, they're guaranteed employment with, with uh, uh, employment partners that we have. So we're, we're, it's a game changer for them. We have um, a high migrant worker population in, in our area. So we're taking those non-credit courses, we're taking non-credit courses in welding, forklift operation, basic office skills, entrepreneurship, out to those workers on a schedule, in a location, in a format that makes sense for them, tuition free. But instead of saying, you know, you, you finish this program, here's a whole basket of nothing. We're, we're, giving them, we're giving them a transcript that is highly detailed, fully accessible, that they own, that they can walk around with, and that they can turn around and use 
using an, an MZ skills database to apply for a job. Uh, it's just right? fantastic. So it, it's a continuum that represents everything we stand for as a community college where we're taking folks who don't have opportunities and through education, giving them opportunities that are, that are really game changers for them, for, for them and their kids and whatever generations come after. That's just brilliant. And Bill, one thing you didn't mention was that it also has your brand, correct? And that yep. just becomes so important because that is the marker of quality that is attached to those those digital badges and alternative yeah. credentials that that are out yeah. there and you know people often tackle me with the question of well what about quality and and I often say well you are the issuer you get to decide what quality is and what it stands for because your brand matters to employers to other institutions that they may go on to study with etc so so well, Absolutely. well done. That's um, that's and it's that you keep coming back, which I just love, Bill, to that notion of leveling the playing field, getting them on the same standing. But of course, the richness of the landing pages when the badges get interrogated means that there's a lot of rich detail that others can then understand yeah. what this person has gone through to be mm -hmm. successful. Well, we describe it as high resolution, like a high yeah. resolution transcript, because if you look at a transcript. What does it have? It has a course title. It has the Carnegie units. It has my grade. That's that's completely inadequate for any sort of meaningful employment, right? We have to look at somebody's transcript, and and I, you know, I was on a hiring committee just earlier this afternoon, where we were looking at transcripts, and I said, "Well, what does that course mean? I don't know. What does it mean to, when you say theoretical studies in educational leadership? What is that class even about? We don't know." But if I could look at, at a set of skills or badges that are associated with that class, and if I could drill into those badges and see how, how those skills are being assessed, my goodness, now they're meaningful, right? Yeah. So that's the kind of, that's the, I mean, it really doesn't just stop with making non-credit classes more powerful. It really is all about empowering our entire, our entire tr transcript and our entire system and just supercharging it to allow folks to really see what's going on. It's a level of transparency that higher ed has never had before. And I love that term, higher res. The other thing I've noticed, Bill, and I'll be coming to you in just a moment, Michael, is that in having that high res detail, we also equip the learner to be able to describe their skills and their capabilities much better than they, or, and with more confidence than they would have had potentially prior to going through the program and certainly talking to hiring managers, that ability in the interview for people to speak with more authority and confidence around the skills that they've developed is huge as well, Bill. Absolutely, absolutely. And and just, just having an awareness of, of the skills that you're focusing on for a course, I can look at a course and I can see here are the badges I'm gonna earn, here are the skills I'm going to earn. Having that, again, it's, it's all about that roadmap, right? It's the GPS that shows you here's where I'm at, Here's where I need to go, and uh, and I think if if you could isolate that, but you can't. But if you could isolate just that fact of knowing what what skills I'm focusing on for a class, I would bet serious money that that all by itself improves learning. I would agree with you. All right, Michael, your turn. Thank you, Bill. Um, specifically about the the use of digital badges in your solution. Michael, what, what, why have they been important and how have they really helped increase and diversify enrollment? Yeah, so um, kind of our, our goal in the beginning was to take a look at everything that we were doing in our traditional way and rethink it. Very much the same way that Bill's talking about here. How can we own their education? How can we allow them to get these quick wins, these these quick shots of, oh man, that felt good to, to succeed here. And the digital badges were a, a way that we were able to do that. And then coupled with, and I think we're gonna talk about later, the pathways inside of Badger Pro, being able to, like Bill's talking about, We may have lost Michael. He's in a bad weather area right now. So Michael, you're frozen for us, right? Oh. 
Michael, you froze there for a, a minute. Can you maybe just repeat what you said? Yeah, absolutely. Sorry about that. Um, it just popped up, said my internet connection is unstable. Bad weather outside right now. Uh, I can own that. I can share that. Or as a community college or an employer who partners with the online work. Michael, we're breaking up with you again. I might just suggest, why don't you just click your video off for us, Michael? Okay. And let's see if that... Sorry, folks, we'll just, uh, Michael's got some seriously bad weather going on outside. Michael, can is, you hear me? Is that, is that better? Yeah, that I believe is better, Michael. So why don't you, so we'll go third time lucky. <laughs> why don't we back up? And if you can say that again for me, that would be great. Okay. All right. Well, we decided. To... To own their education, to own their experience, to own can, can you hear me yeah it's, sort of talk... chop, okay. it's chopping in and out a little bit michael so what i might do is i'm going to go to bill with the next question and maybe hopefully um things will recover a little bit but i do want to come back on that so just hold tight for a second i'll go to bill and let's see if you uh if your internet comes back and behaves a bit a bit more so so bill um the, the next question that i had for you was all around the biggest lessons learned. So if you look back on this journey you've been on and you took the other folks that are listening in on this webinar live or watching the recording, what, what would you want them to know about the biggest lessons learned positively and maybe some of the challenges that you ran into? Well, I mean, we, we took on a, a big task, right? We, we took on the task of badging, uh, almost 2000 classes and uh, you know over 100 150 programs so that that was a big bite but we felt like it was important to do it that way i don't think you have to do it that way necessarily you could start small you could start with a pilot i think the important thing is is to know that we're not talking about throwing carnegie in the trash just yet I think right now what we're looking at is building a system that right now is maybe secondary to Carnegie in terms of, of the official picture. Uh, we're building a system that is adjacent to Carnegie and that can coexist as sort of a value add for students. And we're looking at, you know, what can we do to, to bring this extra value to students and also to sort of shift the conversation because as long as we're talking about seat time, we're limiting what we can do for students. It's the wrong focus. It's, it's an old focus. And it was quite honestly, it was old 70 years ago. There was a Department of Education uh, report on the Carnegie unit that talked about it being outdated and not keeping up with the times and, and all, all, all sorts of things like this. And, and that report was published in, in the early 1900s. And we still have the Carnegie unit. And, and we've, we've been through massive, massive technological change. We advances in medicine and all sorts of things. And we're still doing seat time as our default measure of learning. So we really need to start shifting the conversation. But I think the reason that we've never been able to do away with Carnegie is because of precisely that focus. If we're, if we're focused on doing away with Carnegie, it's hard to replace it. But uh, sort of my master plan is, is to raise this skills-based, high-resolution, student-owned transcript uh, next to the Carnegie unit and, and start shifting the focus, shifting the focus from seat time to authentic assessment, shifting the focus from, uh, from uh, grades to skills, and start shifting the focus from, from, uh, from summary sort of assessment to mastery. Uh, why are we still sitting students in a class for 54 hours and then giving them a big test at the end and then giving them a C? What does a C even mean? And does it mean you're, are you good enough? Do you pass the class? But 
how many of us would like to take uh, have have an, an operation from a surgeon who got C's through college? Do you want the C level surgeon? I don't. I want a surgeon who who's demonstrated mastery to move through the to practice. Who says yes? I have these skills at this level. Mastery. Uh, education should be absolutely about mastery, not not about uh, passing or grades. Uh, we've got it all wrong. We've got it wrong for a long time. Uh, so my intent is just to begin shifting that focus. And I, I understand that it, it may be beyond my lifetime <laughs> when Carnegie goes away. But if I can help plant those seeds while right now giving immediate value to our students, then, then I'll feel happy about it. That's Thank you, Bill. I believe Michael's internet might have uh, restabilized. So do you want to come back on camera, Michael? We'll give this a shot. Here he comes. All right, let's fingers crossed, Michael. We're going to back you up, my friends, to uh, the role of digital badges in your solution. Let's go for it. Okay, well, we'll try. Something's going wrong, but um, the idea is that their results, they, are, they own their badges, they own their learning, right? So if I'm is that I need to take to a supervisor and say, hey, I've done crane and rigging. I can hold it up on my phone and I can show the supervisor, hey, I've got the training that I need. If I need confidence to start the day afresh, I've got this learning, this digital badge that I've, I own. It's on a platform that's all my own. Um, and it means, and I can, I can take it with me. And um, the digital badges, like I said, I, don't know if you heard it, but they've they've helped learners to get those little shots of I can do it. Confidence builders, you know, because we we have these competency based small chunks of learning, an hour long at the most, where they take it, they see some success, they get a badge, they see their progress along a pathway um, toward a final milestone badge that they can then um, own, and um, it. And a beautiful thing to touch and see people kind of get their confidence that never had any confidence. You know, they've never had any success in learning before. Um, and hopefully That's you were right, able Michael. to hear any of that. Yeah, no, we got about 98% of it that time, which is fantastic. Um, Eric has just fired in a question into the chat. And if I can encourage others to do that, we're about 7.3 minutes before I open up to your questions. So if you can start firing your questions, uh, into the, the chat box, that would be super. And Cheryl is there monitoring them. Um, Michael, um, Bill was just talking about some of the biggest lessons he's learned. And Bill, I am going to come back to you to follow up on assessment, because I know that's typically um, a challenge many people run into. But Michael, you've gone off camera. Can you still hear us? I can. Just trying right. to save the internet. Yeah, yeah. Good for you. So Michael, what are the um, the biggest the biggest lessons learned for you? So in, in Mississippi, there hasn't been a lot of experience with people and digital badges. Um, and so trying to help people understand that this is not some digital sticker that I got in kindergarten, but that this actually means something, right? That it's not just a, a pretty picture, but it's full of data that I can share that's machine readable and I can give to people and they can see, oh, well, I can put this in my computer system or I can um, give this to my HR manager. And this is a for real badge, um, helping to shift that conversation and to, for employers and organizations to understand what a digital badge is, has been a, a, um, a major lesson learned. And then understanding that people aren't going to be quick to jump on this train, you know, that, you know, kind of like Bill's talking about that it's, it's, it takes a minute to try to shift people's understanding that they've had for a hundred years to now we're here, something new, um, that this has been, a, it's been an interesting, interesting go, but, um, as more stakeholders, especially from the state level and, um, our sister institutions get on board with this idea, uh, we're seeing a lot of success, a lot of different, um, good ideas for people using these bats. That's great, Michael. Um, thank you. Um, so we've got a couple of questions firing in now, which is terrific. Thank you, folks. 
Bill assessment. Every time I engage with a, a K through 12 school or a tertiary institution, um, everybody gets super excited and they, they get it all and then they hit assessment and you see everybody just pause. What are some of the lessons that you've learned around assessment, Bill? Listen, I, I know everybody sort of has their eyes roll into the back of their head when they start thinking about assessment, but the reality is assessment is really exciting. If, if you've studied how people learn, I, I know I just, I just put myself in a bad position here by saying that, but, but if, you, if you've really spent some time investigating how people learn, right? and how to measure learning in a meaningful, effective way. Authentic assessment, and I, I didn't just say assessment, right? I said authentic assessment, direct assessment of learning is, is hands down the best way to do it. There's no question in my mind. And if we can tie direct authentic assessment to the awarding of badges, at a discrete level, I think we've just won education. I mean, I, th I think it's that big of a deal. It's, it's also that big of a challenge, but um, <clears throat> I've got a colleague or two in, in the community college system who, who are involved with our, our capital A assessment efforts across, across the community colleges. And, and granted, we've got a long way to go. The theory is solid, but the practice is difficult. And, and part of the reason that the practice is difficult is because the way we look at education right now is if you sit in the seat for 54 hours and listen to me lecture and you pass the test with a C or better at the end of the class, then I'm going to give you the credit. And we know that that's a, if we search ourselves, we know that, that, that a, a, a big final multiple choice exam is, is just a proxy measure for learning. It's not a direct assessment. It's not an authentic assessment. But that's what we have and that's what we've been raised on. And 99% of us who are involved in higher education experienced that firsthand as students when we were in higher education. And we've, we've handed it down uh, through the ages, through the generations of, of faculty and professors, but, but it doesn't mean that it's good. And so this effort to shift the, shift the thinking of uh, from, from what we do our teaching practice, which isn't always great, to this idea of, of an assessment-oriented model, that's another big shift. Um, and lucky for me, I guess, uh, those two big shifts that I'm trying to make really complement each other well. Because if we're talking about expressing uh, student learning in a real, authentic, meaningful way, and over here, we're talking about assessing learning in a real, authentic, meaningful way. Then all of a sudden, we can see that continuum and we can begin to paint a picture of what education could be for people. And I think that's the, the really difficult first step is, is sort of giving people a vision of, of what teaching and learning and what education could be if we, if we do it right. And we're a long way from that. And we've got a lot of folks who are working really, really hard to be great teachers. Um, and, and some of those folks hear the word assessment and think immediately, uh, this is about extra work for me as a faculty, because now not only do I have to teach, but I also have to assess. And that's, that's the wrong, wrong mindset out of the gate. We really need to learn about assessment and then ask ourselves the question of how do, how do I change my teaching? to provide meaningful inroads to this assessment at a, at a granular student learning outcome sort of level. So it, it, what we're really talking about is a, a sort of a sea change, but um, we can do this a little bit at a time. And I, I think that's, that's, otherwise we're just gonna, it's too much, people's minds will explode. Yep. And, and Bill, because a lot of what we've been talking about today is about helping people get access to learning for job-related outcomes, both for you mm -hmm. and Michael, of course, the more we can move to authentic assessment, the more employers are going to value um, the, yeah. the, uh, the, the learning that's been undertaken and the ability for the individual to be successful on the job. So there really isn't any choice 
um, Absolutely. To, to shift towards authentic assessment because otherwise will increasingly become irrelevant in programs that are specifically aimed at sort of helping people get a job or get ahead in their lives. And so it just, yeah. it, in my mind, I'm right there with you. Cheryl, I'm gonna invite you back and you've got a question for Michael that's come out of the, the chat. So welcome back, Cheryl. Welcome, or thank you. I was gonna say, um, to, I thought Michael might pop back in. I was gonna say welcome and good luck. Yeah, there he is. Good try. Uh, Michael, there was a question in chat um, about, I think it was coming from Ebony. Uh, if you want to comment on the 80% completion rate, how did you keep your learners engaged with their past so that they'd actually complete the path? Right, so um, Ebony, that's a fantastic question. We have very short, like one hour max modules that are designed to kind of help move people through. And like I was saying before, they they take these modules starting with you know less complex and they move toward more complex uh modules but the idea that they get these quick kind of shots in the arm of success um with the the modules and it feels good to them they get that badge they get awarded they're like oh okay well i'm gonna keep moving through and the content is designed for that right it's to help there's not a lot of it's not a talking head it's uh kind of interactive uh, some of them are fun little animations, but the, the content is solid. There's a competency-based assessment at the end of it where they have to make 100 on the quiz. They can take it as many times as they want, and then they move to the next step in their pathway. But it's the idea of these short little micro-credentials, micro-competency-based courses that feel good for success. And I think that that's what keeps them moving along through the, through the programs to, until they kind of get their badge. And then the pathways in Badger will recommend further learning for them. So they continue on to, to greater success um, in, in our pathways or into um, you know, further training and further successes there. And so that, I think it's that idea that that good feeling they get when they get that badge, they get that little, that little competency that moves them through the, the, the modules there. Great, Cheryl. Um, before you jump to the next one, that's uh, for both of our panelists, uh, Michael. Um, obviously, um, pathways, which you've just talked about, um, Bill's talked about why they've been so important for the work that he's been leading. What, what, what are your thoughts about why being able to construct complex or or or, or sophisticated pathways in Badger has been so important for you? Besides, sort of that that retention on course. What else? did Pathways do for you? Well, the Pathways were probably the, the number one thing that brought us to Badger, uh, besides it working so well with Canvas, and because it fits so well with the idea at our institution that everything is workforce. And so being able to take students from where they are to a job through the course of a Pathway fit just in line, perfectly in line with what the institution is doing. And so um having having the ability to say hey adult education um what is it that you want people to learn well adult ed director says i want people to have a pathway from introduction to careers to understand what they can do now take a step into a welding career pathway get the foundation for a welding pathway and then step into training program they can take these steps, they can see their steps, and they can follow it the entire way with digital badges. And um, having that sort of power, and then from the HR side, so we give admin access to uh, Badger spaces to our HR directors or our partners that we're partnering with. And they can see students' progress as they're going through. They can print out a, a CSV, or they can just see it in the Badger platform. They can see the learner's progress through this. And that has been unbelievably powerful uh, for, for um, users to see there. Brilliant, thank you, Michael. Back mm -hmm. to you, Cheryl. I think this is a great question. I know we haven't really talked about this, but I have to imagine for both of you being technical colleges that you've thought about the integration with high schools, or maybe you've had conversations with high schools, but this question from Randy, 
is um, I'm coming here as a high school educator and I'm wondering if there's been any work like this at the high school ever, and, and including stuff that you may have heard of, not just at your own, in your own areas. Why don't we go to Bill first? Bill, what, what have you observed with high schools? Well, uh, you know, high schools have an interesting mix, right? I mean, high schools have a, a mix of college prep work and they do some vocational work as well. Um, but interestingly enough, we're, we're actually partnering with high schools. We've got an extensive early college program. And in fact, uh, in our area, we're graduating students uh, from high school uh, one week and then the week after that they graduate from Bakersfield College with an associate's degree so we're actually going deep with the high schools uh, in that way but for for every other high school out there I would say that just still have meaning they may not have the the same types of meaning that they they would at a, at a college obviously if you're doing any sort of vocational work at a high school level you're preparing students for an immediate career out to, out of high school and that's great and the skills are immediately applicable. In the college prep world, I think there's still some value because our high schools are still operating on a Carnegie, on a Carnegie sort of model, right? So if we can start shifting, <laughs> here's, a, here's, a, here's another angle, right? We can start shifting the mindset of our students much earlier. If we can start helping our students to focus on what are the skills? I mean, we've all, we've all sat in geometry, right? And, or algebra and said, uh, you know, we're doing the Pythagorean theorem. When am I ever going to use this, right? The old adage of when am I ever going to use this in my life after this class, except maybe in college when I have to relearn the same thing. Um, so maybe some of those questions can begin to be answered and maybe we can help students. We can, we're already talking about bringing uh, pathways program mapping into the high school level. We've already extended it through the four-year universities, but why not bring it to the high schools? Why not begin to develop that roadmap and that vision for learning early on? Uh, whether they're looking for an immediate career outside of high school or whether they're looking to go on to a, a college or university for additional studies, help, help students see that, that map and, and see the, the meaning in in some of the educational work that they're doing even in high school. So yeah, I think there's value there in a lot of ways. It may not be the same, the same type of value that we would have, uh, we would talk about it at a college level, but certainly there's value. Thank you, Bill. Michael, what are your thoughts on high school? Yeah, so it, I think it's a fantastic question. And um, we have had a couple of discussions with our uh, state superintendent um, specifically for what we call a smart start. In the state of Mississippi, there's a, 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 an initiative with the adult ed programs called Smart Start. And it's basically teaching people how to, I'm sorry to use this, but to how to adult, right? Uh, financial literacy, how to fill out a resume, how to just you know, be successful being in the adult world. And um, it, it caught so much traction in our adult ed programs that at Jones, we've used it for um, an orientation class at the college. So that, cause we know that if they're gonna be successful in life, they're gonna be successful, more successful students at Jones. And so what we've done, we've taken that and we've piloted it at our, um, at our K through 12 institutions. Um, and through the online workforce college, we've taken some online modules um, specifically the, the financial literacy, because we don't have very many bankers that are teaching high school classes to our, our students. And then we've taken some, uh, that like I said, that introduction to careers uh, classes and introduced that to our high school students to help give them an idea of what's out there and how to just be successful. And we've seen a lot of success. And then, like I said, those pathways, being able to step people. So you have your dual enrollment classes and that's not the students I'm talking about. I'm talking about the students who don't qualify for your dual enrollment, who maybe are, Randy, like you're talking about in the CTE classes or the, um, you know, they don't even know where they're supposed to be because they don't know. And you don't know what you don't know, but if we can open up opportunities and give you ideas and skills that maybe you can use to be successful as an adult or open up avenues for training or learning um, through these short online workforce skills modules, then it gives you success 
some confidence and continue to moving through, hopefully stepping from one pathway in high school into another pathway later on, whether that's leading to training or college or straight to a job. Thank you, Michael. And I noticed Joachim's put an observation into the chat that Randy's responded to. Cheryl, you've worked quite a bit with high schools. What, what have been your observations of their use of digital badges? Yeah, when we have a partner in Georgia in the technical college system, and they are working on MOUs with their high schools. And, and they, they have a severe shortage of forklift drivers in Georgia. And so they're looking at high schools and saying, you know, for your summer job, you could take these three badges that will stack toward being able to operate a forklift and you're gonna make $25 an hour as your summer job. Um, so it's interesting how different colleges are thinking about this. It doesn't have to be a huge scale and it can also be something that high school teachers are just using in their class. Free badger, you can you could do all of that um, with, without having to scale up to a huge uh, system, you know, waiting for your stakeholders, you can do it within, but in, of course, in having these credentials of value, there has to be a little bit more strategic intent. Yep. Thank you, Cheryl. And Bill, picking up on your wonderful expression of high res, I'm working with a lot of schools that realize that they're graduating high school students without any evidence of all of the other skills and competencies that they've developed outside their classes, leadership, communication, problem solving, field research, all of these incredibly valuable competencies. What I'm seeing they're doing is standing up 21st century uh, competency badges where they're observing the students exhibit those competencies and behaviors, and they're writing that to their high school transcript. So similar to what you described with high res, we start to get a much more high res view. And of course, as universities and colleges all around the world move towards more portfolio-based or whole of student-based admission standards, that sort of adds to the value of the individual with the backing of their high school to put their best foot forward as to who they are as the whole individual, which I think is really, really um, fantastic that they're thinking that way. Bill, you came yeah. off mic. Did you want to add anything to that? Yeah, no, I, I just I just want to give a big amen to what you're saying. Honestly, I... I... I couldn't have been more thrilled during COVID to to uh, see some some big colleges and universities kicking the SATs to the curb. Uh, I think you know it's a huge disservice. It's proven to be inequitable. Uh, we need to we need to look at the whole student picture. And one of the great ways we can do that is a a more rich descriptor filled uh, transcript. And uh, you know let's let's just hope and pray that even following COVID, we continue to, to move in that direction. I mean, I think some of the wheels were, were in motion before COVID, but it, I, I wasn't sad uh, to see uh, the, the SAT and the, uh, you know, the ACT being dropped um, by, you know, UCs and uh, CSUs and several privates in California. I don't, I don't have a good picture of the global, global uh, movement in that direction, but I, I you can sort of count on on if if the UC is doing it, um, it's it's a big deal. Agreed, Cheryl. You, we've got time for one last question, and I know you are intrigued uh, by what Bill and Michael might have to say about faculty. Do you want to put a question to them about that? Yeah, I'm just curious. Um, I know faculty are important stakeholders in this change, and it can be a lot of change. So I'm just curious for, to hear from both of you about how you managed that change and what kind of feedback you got from faculty as they made not just adjustments to the pathways and badges, but some of the changes that, that came with that. Michael, let's go to you first and then we'll wrap it up with Bill. Okay, yeah, so uh, the way that faculty and staff can use our platform is very much like the way an e-textbook. Um, so it hasn't been a huge shift for them. Uh, they basically insert our modules into their, their uh, content their courses, um, unless they're utilizing the entire pathway to you know, further learning. Um, so there hasn't, I've got an unstable message. I'm sorry if I'm cutting out. Keep um, going, keep going, Michael. Okay. There hasn't been a huge shift for faculty. Um, I've just had to rethink a lot of our, um, the way that we present the information and the instructions and making sure that we 
are not just supporting, but we are wrapping up our faculty and being hugely supportive because this is a very different way of thinking for a lot of, of our faculty than they are used to. Yep. So not doing it to them, but investing in them and bringing them along for the ride, which Absolutely. has been the lifelong lesson I've learned in faculty engagement. Bill, what about from your perspective? Well, from our from our perspective, um, a few things we've been very careful and very intentional about communicating to faculty. Uh, the first being that we're not going to force any changes upon their curriculum right now. That this this is, as I said, it, it is truly a secondary system. Uh, to me, it's a, the more important of the two systems. But but it is the secondary system. We're bringing it up alongside a system that has been firmly in place for a very long time. Uh, we're, we are not changing the curricular process. We are not changing the curricular content. We're, we're adding to it, we're enhancing it. It's a value add. And that's, that's been a very clear and intentional message from us to the faculty from the beginning. Um, and, and we are, we, we've used extensive piloting of, of some of these concepts with specific areas who are interested who immediately saw the value. Obviously we've leveraged uh, our career and technical education areas to be sort of leaders in this area, but um, we are making our way across the curriculum. I mean, we have, we have badges designed and are in the process of inputting with skills across the curriculum for every single course, every single program, uh, you know, from, from philosophy to theoretical endeavors to, you know, forklift driving. So, uh, you know, it's it's it, it's a global it's a global move for us. It's big, but we're but we're trying to be strategic and very intentional about it, what we're doing here. And what we're doing here is providing additional value for students. And in the end, that's really hard to argue against, right? No, we don't want to. We it doesn't require a lot of extra faculty work, not right now. Um, it, we're not forcing them to change how they teach, although we'd like them to. We're not, we're not changing the curriculum, although down the road, we'd like to do that too. Right now, we're just giving students extra value and, and we've got folks who are doing most of the work for them. We, we gather faculty input, but it's voluntary. So um, we're, we're being very mindful that we, we don't wanna throw additional hours of work on faculty's shoulders. They're already busy, they're tapped out. They can't really, they don't have the capacity, but, but if we can easily bring up at a secondary system that's a sort of a shadow system to our, our, our mainstream curriculum that just gives students extra value and extra employability. It's really hard to argue against that, right? It sure is, Bill. And uh, for those uh, watching live or those that watch afterwards, I think Michael and Bill have just given you an unbelievably good playbook about how to get started and how to sort of bring everybody along for the journey rather than anybody feel that this is something that's burdensome, onerous, or too disruptive for them right now. So thank you. Folks, this has been a wonderful conversation. Cheryl, a big thank you to you for co-hosting with me. To Bill and Michael, thank you. Michael, I know how frustrating that must have been for you with the weather outside. Stay safe, stay away from those storms. I'm glad they're moving away. To everybody that took the time to be with us live today, thank you for being here. And for everybody who joins later and watches, we hope you get as much out of it as we all have as we've gone through this terrific conversation today. And, um, and we'll be continuing the conversation with more webinars. And we hope that you'll continue to stay engaged and really build on the wonderful work of Bill and Michael and Cheryl and others. Take good care, everybody. And we'll see you again at the next webinar. Bye for now. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.